<laughs> well, good morning, Golden Corner Church. I love this second group. You've, you've just got so much enthusiasm. That you're few in number, but you've got so much enthusiasm. I just love coming here to uh, share the Word of God with you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, this morning, I want to uh, wrap up a series of sermons that I have chosen to entitle Defiance, Dare to be Different. And Now, if you're visiting with us for the first time or if you've missed the other sermons, this is what we've been doing. We've just been working our way through the Old Testament book of Esther. And thus far, we've covered the first three chapters. There are ten chapters, by the way, and if you caught what I said, I'm wrapping it up. So, yes, you're right. We're going to be covering seven full chapters in one service. And so you might be thinking, I wish I had packed lunch. Yeah, before it's over with, you may be thinking that very thing. Uh, if, you, if, if you've missed the other two sermons, here's what we've learned thus far. Followers of God should be defiant, not compliant. Let me explain that statement. To comply with God, we will eventually have to defy the world. If we're going to follow God, we can't bow to the gods of this world. Gods such as wealth, materialism, achievement, etc. We can't buy into their belief system, uh, their philosophies, I guess I could say, such as self is first, and uh, right and wrong is determined by the situation you're in. That's one of the philosophies of this world. We can't buy into that. Consistently saying yes to God will eventually require saying a firm no to this world. When we're defiant, we need not expect the world to stand up and applaud us. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Rather than applauding, I'll bet you that somebody will attack us. Dare to be different, and someone is going to make us his or her target, which will result in slander. I know you appreciate these encouraging words I've been sharing over the past few weeks. Slander, maybe mocking us, criticizing us, perhaps ostracizing us from the circle. For that reason, in order to avoid, and we know this, that's not a news flash. this is not something new, and we know that, so oftentimes to avoid trouble, we comply with the world, even if it means defying God. You see what I'm saying? You know, to avoid trouble, oftentimes we just do what everyone else is doing, even if it means that we're disobeying God. Guys, we got to stop that. How's that for just being point blank? We've got to stop that. Compromise is costly. It's costing us. What are we going to do? We're going to dare to be different. Make no mistake about it. Being different is a daring act. It takes courage to defy the world. And where is this courage going to come from? I believe that if you and I could just see and know and understand the primary lesson that the book of Esther has to reveal to us, if we could get a hold of that one lesson, it would give us the courage that we need to dare to be different and to become defiant rather than compliant. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to give you an overview of the book of Esther. Now that means it's going to take me about 20 minutes so if you want to know what you're going to do with the rest of the next 20 minutes of your life, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you, as concise as I can, the story of the book of Esther, and we're going to see that primary point. So here's what I need from you. I need you to whisper a quick prayer to God from your heart and ask you to do this. Just say, God, help me get this. You got it? God, help me get this. Let's do a little bit of backtracking. We've already learned that the story of Esther was set in ancient Persia. The reigning king, now guys, I've got to tell you, I may go fast. If I get too fast in what I'm saying, just kind of flag me down. Because my vacation starts as soon as this service is over. So sometimes on those Sundays, I put the pedal to the floor and I'm moving. You got it? So if I get too fast, just wave at me and say, hang on, slow down. We're not going on vacation next week, so slow down, preacher. We know that this story was set in ancient Persia. The reigning king was a guy named Xerxes. 
From the palace in the city of Susa, he reigned over 127 provinces and scattered throughout all those provinces there were Jews. Now these were God's people and most of them I believe were trying to live godly lives in an ungodly culture. One of these Jews was a guy named Mordecai. Mordecai had a decent job on the king's staff and he was raising a young cousin of his as though she were his own daughter and her name was Esther. There was this national competition to determine who the next queen of Persia was going to be. And so Esther entered the competition and she won it. She became the queen of Persia, Xerxes' new queen. Now through this whole process, and even after she became queen, she never disclosed her nationality. She never told anyone that she was Jewish. I think that was to kind of protect her from prejudicial treatment, maybe even some persecution. Now Mordecai in the context of his day-to-day duties, learned of an assassination attempt against the king. And he passed word on to Esther, this is what these guys are planning. She passed it on to the king, and those two men were executed. Now what Mordecai had shared went into the king's records. This is what happened, this is who's responsible for saving your life. All right. Now while this is all taking place, Xerxes creates a new position in his government. I guess we would call it the prime minister. And this was going to be his number two man. Second only to the king. You know, the the second most powerful man in all of Persia. And he appointed a guy named Haman to this post. Now, along with his appointment to become prime minister, King Xerxes commanded that everyone who sees him on the street, if you meet him at Walmart, wherever you run into him, you're supposed to bow down immediately and, in essence, worship him as though he were a god. Now, most people, this really wasn't a problem. But it was a problem for Mordecai. Mordecai wouldn't do it. He just, he just refused to do that. And we found out it wasn't because he was just belligerent. He was Jewish, which means he had a god, Haman wasn't his God. And uh, Mordecai's God had commanded that he never bow down and worship anyone or anything else other than him. So here's what Mordecai was doing. He was defying the king's command so that he could obey God's command. He was defiant, not compliant. Well, how do you think Haman? Now, Haman eventually finds out that this is a faith issue. Now, how do you think he responded to that? Do you think he went, wow, man, I just... You got to admire a man of his convictions, his religious convictions. I kind of get this, and I'm going to give him up. You think that's what it was? No, 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 no. We looked at this last week. Haman was like, "Look, I'm not tolerating this. Uh, if he's not going to bow, I'm going to punish him." And he came up with this idea that rather than just killing Mordecai, I'm going to kill every Jew in every and all the 127 provinces in Persia. I'll kill them all. He goes to the king, he gets his permission to do this. He actually convinces the king to make it a law that on March the 7th, this was about a year into the future, March the 7th, it it is legal for you to kill your Jewish neighbor. As a matter of fact, it would be illegal for you not to. And uh, whoever these Jews are that you kill, you can take their property to be your own. So the king made it a law, it was circulated through the kingdom. How do you think the Jewish community responded when they found out about this law? Well, of course, they were confused. What in the world would bring this on? You know, they were frightened, of course, but a just great cloud of sorrow just kind of enveloped the Jewish people. And, and the Jew that was the most distraught was Mordecai himself. I kind of think maybe he blamed himself for all this. Maybe he's having some second thoughts like, you know, if I had just bowed, we could have avoided all of this. Maybe, and I, I don't know. But he is so distraught, the Bible said he walked out into the city streets. He's weeping. He's wailing. He's mourning. He makes his way to the entrance to the palace, and somebody there recognized this is the queen's cousin. This is, this, this is Mordecai. They go to the queen and say, Esther, something's bad wrong with Mordecai. So she enlists the help of a messenger. She said, go find out what's wrong with him. He goes out to talk. Mordecai explains the whole situation. You know, my people are going to be attacked uh, by Haman, he's got permission from the king. It's now a law. He's got a copy of the law. And he says, take this to Esther so she knows exactly what's going on. But he said, tell her this. She's got to go talk to the king. She's got to, she's got to use her position, her title, 
as some leverage to try to talk some sense into him. So the messenger goes, he explains all this to Esther, and Esther you know, sends word back to him and says, sorry, I can't do that. And he said, this is the way it goes down. Unless the king invites you in, you can't go in. Even myself, the queen, if I just walk into his throne room, unannounced, uninvited, he's going to kill me. I'll die. So make sure Mordecai knows I can't do what he wants me to do. And so the messenger takes the message to Mordecai, and Mordecai sends a message back, and it's one of the most famous messages in all the Bible. I want you to read it together with me. Esther chapter 4, verse 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther, Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Now, wait a minute. Let's back up. That was vacation, Pastor. Getting in too much of a hurry. Right? You're going to slow down. He said, verse number 14, this is so critical. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise. Are you seeing this? will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Key sentence. I guess maybe I should say key question. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. You know what he's saying? Honey, I'm starting to put two and two together here and figure something out. It's no coincidence that you're the queen now. It's no coincidence that, you're, that, this, that Persia now has a Jewish queen. I think that God arranged this, put you on the throne, so that you would be the voice of your people, and you would use the leverage of your position at this time, and I think you need to do this. He said, however, if you don't, I am fully convinced that deliverance will arise from somewhere. In other words, you know what he's saying? God's going to do something. God's going to come through in the end. I think you've got a chance to be a part of that. But even if you balk at this out of fear, God's going to come through and he's going to deliver us. So the message is delivered to Esther and she sends a message back to him. She said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go in and talk to the king. And if I die, I die. If he kills me, that's so be it. That's just going to happen. But he said, here's what I need from you. Mordecai, get these Jews together, every Jew in the city of Susa, and you're going to fast for three days. No eating, no food. What that meant was during this three-day period of time, you're going to do a whole lot of praying. That's what you're going to do. And she said, my maids and I, we're going to be praying as well. And so on the third day of that fast, she goes into the throne room, not knowing what's going to happen to her. And as, as the king sees her, he says, honey, come on in. You know what that tells me? Prayer was working. Come on in. And she goes in. He says, uh, what could I do for you today? He said, I'll do anything you ask up to giving you half of my kingdom. Man, he's feeling pretty good, pretty generous. You know what that tells me? Prayer is working. She said, I'll tell you what I would like. I would like to uh, have lunch with you and Haman. Just you and Haman today. That's all I want. He went, okay, we can do that. They send for Haman. They have lunch together. It's just the queen. Here's the king, and here's old Haman. The king says, honey, surely there's something else you want. She said, yeah, there is. I, I want to do this again tomorrow. Same time, same place, same group. Just you, king, just you, Haman, and me. Good deal. Everybody agreed. Put it on their calendar. This time, tomorrow, same place, same event. Going to have lunch together. Haman leaves. And i got to tell you something. He is walking on a cloud. He is feeling so good about himself. You think about this. The queen had a luncheon. And the only two people invited are the king and Haman. He's in that tiny little upper tier of people in Persia. And he feels so good. And he's walking out. He comes to the city gate. And I'm telling you, people are bound down. They're, worship, they're feeding his ego. They're worshiping him. And all of a sudden, he looks. And sitting there is Mordecai. He didn't stand, the Bible said. Nor did he bow. He was completely unyielding. 
He was downright stubborn about this. The Bible said not only was he unyielding. In other words, he was totally unimpressed with Haman. But he was unintimidated by Haman. We have caused Haman to blow a fuse. He went home. He set his family down. He said, do you know how much money I got? Man, he starts telling them, I got this much money. Look at all I own. Look at all that I've accomplished. You know, the, the, the highest position of land comes open. I was chosen. He's going through all this list. And then he said this. He said, in spite of all of this, I'm absolutely miserable. I'm not enjoying any of it. And you know why? It's that Jew Mordecai's fault. He's to blame for all this until he bows to me or he's taken care of. I will never be able to enjoy my life. His family said, well, you know what? If that's the case, then there's a simple solution. Take him out of the equation. Here's what we're recommending. Uh, go to the king first thing in the morning and request permission to impale Mordecai. Anybody here during the first sermon when we talked about uh, impalement and what that process consisted of? Because I'm not going to go back into that today. I think I grossed some people out, one including my wife, who said don't ever do that again. So I'm not. I'm not. They said have him impaled. And so he said, that's a good idea. So they went out and cut a 75-foot long pole. Don't you think that's a little overkill? 75 feet for one man. And, and so they, they get this pole, they skin it, they sharpen it, they dig the hole for it. Because putting the, you know, after you inserted the pole in person, you drop the pole, you got it, got it, drop it in the ground, hang him up. 75 feet, they're going to make an example out of this guy. And so he, 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 this is, he, so I believe he turned in early, set the clock a little earlier. He was going to be down at the, at the palace first thing in the morning. And, and this is what his family said, get this taken care of so you can enjoy your lunch with the king and the queen. Just get it taken care of. So, man, he, he goes down the next morning. The, I, I believe it's just gray dawn. He comes walking in the courtyard, and, and he doesn't. There's something that's happened that he's not aware of. The king hadn't slept a wink that night. Not a wink. Had a sleepless, restless night. He even called his royal secretaries in and said, get out the royal records and, and just read to me. Now, this must have been some boring stuff. I guess in Persia they didn't have Ambien, so they said just, and they didn't have Ronnie Hodges' sermons, because they seem to have that effect on some people, and I don't want to point anybody out right now, but he said, it must have been some, but read me this stuff. And so they began to read, and they said, okay, there's this record of a guy named Mordecai, and uh, he foiled an assassination attempt against you, and the only reason you're alive is because he reported this. And the king said, well, what do we ever do with that guy? I mean, he saved my life. Wouldn't it stand a reason that we would have shown our appreciation, that we would have honored him in some way? And the secretary looked and said, uh, apparently, uh, Zippo, nothing. We didn't do anything. Well, about the time he hears somebody stirring in the courtyard, he asked the secretary, who is that? I said, that's Haman. He assumes Haman has overheard that, in conversation, that conversation and knows what they're talking about. So he said, Haman, come on in here. Haman comes walking in, and he looked at Haman, and he said, Haman, what in the world should I do just to show, just to show honor to a man that I'm really pleased with? You know what Haman thinks? Now, remember, he's an arrogant dude. You know what he thinks? He's got to be talking about me. I mean, who, you know, who's brought the king more pleasure than me? So he starts thinking of what would I want the king to do to honor me. He said, well, you're asking me, this is what I would do. I would get one of your highest officials, I don't know, maybe in the military, government, didn't really matter, get one of the highest officials, give them access to the royal walk-in closet. Let them go in there and walk among your clothing. Let them pick out a royal robe. I mean one that's really stylish, one that's kind of flamboyant, that might stand out, one that people have seen you in. Let him pick out one of those and then let him go down. And then take that, let that official go down to the royal stables and pick out a horse. One of those that wears the royal crest and one that you ride often, King, that people see you on. And then you take, let that official put this robe on the man you want to honor. Help him onto the horse. And then you let that official lead that horse up and down one street after another in Susa, shouting out loud, this is what the king does for people that he wants to honor. That's what I'd do. The king said, that's absolutely brilliant. And who better than you? 
He said, uh, go into my closet. You pick out the robe. I mean, you, it's your right. You pick out the robe. And then go down to the stables and you pick out the horse. And when you've got the robe and you've got the horse, then go get Mordecai. Can you imagine what's going through Haman's mind? I can, I can almost hear him go, uh, pardon me? I, I got the robe and the horse part. What was that last part? I want you to go get Mordecai. Why do I need Mordecai? He said, he's the man I want to honor. I want you to put the robe on him. You're going to dress him. Huh? Uh, you're going to help him get on the horse. And then you're going to take the reins of that horse and you're going to lead him up and down one street after another if it takes all day long shouting this is what the king does for the man he wants to honor you're going to get to do that so he did I imagine it was a very you know the dude had to go to bed that night thinking tomorrow's going to be a great day I'm going to take care of Mordecai once and for all I'm going to watch him impaled he's going to be hanging up in my backyard writhing on a stick you know what and then I'm going to go have lunch with the queen and the king. And we're going to hobnob. We're going to have a big time. It's going to be a great day. Let me tell you, this day is turning south in a hurry. Well, how do you think it's affected him? He goes, he does just exactly what he's supposed to do. How do you think it affected him? The Bible said it humiliated him. It said he actually covered his head. I don't know if he got a grocery bag or a tater sack, cut little holes in it. But he covered his head. And he ran to the house in shame. He goes in, I believe his wife asked him, Hey, man, what you doing with a sack on your head? I believe that's got to be the first question. You know what? He begins to explain to them what has just happened to him, how everything is backfiring against him. And I believe as he's explaining this, there's this look of terror that comes over their face, and they make a very astute observation. And what was it? I want you to read it with me. Chapter number 6, verse number 13. It said, When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends what had happened, his wise advisors and his wife said, Since Mordecai... This man who is humiliated, what, what, what a man, right? Mordecai didn't have anything to do with it. He didn't know what was going on. He said, so this man who is humiliated is of Jewish birth. Are you seeing this? Now, this next sentence is really big. You got it? You will never succeed in your plans against him. Did you get it? You will, what's that word? Never succeed in your plans against him. Look at this. It will be fatal for you to continue opposing him. I believe you've written your own death certificate. Oh, can I give you the Hodge paraphrase here, the Hodge translation? I think this is what they said. Uh, it appears to us you may have picked a fight with one of God's kids. And in picking a fight with one of his kids, you've actually picked a fight with him, and we don't think you're going to win. huh? That's what they're saying. Well, just as the conversation ended, here come these, these people from the palace to take him to the banquet. So he's on his way to the banquet. He gets there, and the Bible says that the king and the queen were having a glass of wine. I believe they're sipping on a glass of wine. i, I got to believe Haman is not sipping on a glass of wine. I believe he is knocking back one goblet after another. What a rotten day! Well, she's about to get a whole lot worse. The king looked at Queen Esther, and he said, Now, I know you got something on your mind, something you're wanting. What is it, honey? Up to half the kingdom. You just name it. She said, okay, this is what I want. I want my life to be spared. Man, can you see Xerxes snap just to attention? I want my life to be spared. And I want the lives of my people to be spared. I think this is where she disclosed to him, I'm Jewish. Because he asked, who, who is threatening you? Who would dare threaten my queen? Well, i got to believe Haman at this point put the goblet down and may have just grabbed the whole bottle. And he's... <laughs> Esther turned and she said, she looks at Haman and she said, him. He is. The Bible said Haman was so frightened Every bit of color bleached out of his face. He turned white as a sheet. The king was so angry he couldn't keep seated. He got up and he started kind of walking around. He walks out of the room. Now what happened next, I'm not 100% sure of. 
Uh, but apparently, Haman must have gotten up to go over to Esther to plead for mercy, to plead for his life. Now, I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe he stumbled and fell. But the Bible said he ended up on top of the queen as she's lying on her couch. Not a good place to be when the king came walking back into the room. The king walks in. There's Haman lying on his queen. And he assumed the worst And he actually even said out loud, who does this guy think he is? Is he going to assault the queen right in front of me? You talk about bad to worse, things things are really unraveling quickly. And then he said out loud, there must have been some people who come in and said, what am I going to do with this guy? There was a fellow that spoke up and said, "Uh, on my way to work this morning, I came by his house. Did you know that he has a 75 foot tall pole in his backyard? And the word is, he came here this morning to ask for permission to impale Mordecai on that thing. Just a thought, but King, if I were you, everything's ready, everything's in place, I'd impale him on it. Haman's listening to this conversation. Can you imagine him saying, hey, I'm here. I'm in the room. I'm listening to this. King said, that's a good idea. They take Haman home, walk him out into the backyard. Pole. Man on end of pole. Pole goes in ground. Man 75 feet in there wondering, what have I done? king then turns to Esther and said, uh, you know, he's, he's a well-off guy. Remember he offered 375 tons of silver to the king for the opportunity. To, he's a well-off guy. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you all of his businesses to Esther. I'm going to give you all of his, his all the farms he owns, um, his checking accounts, saving accounts, stock portfolio, uh, all the ATVs, tractors, everything he's got. It's yours. She goes to Mordecai and goes, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. I, I can't manage all this by myself. She made Mordecai the executor of Haman's estate. So she takes Mordecai to meet the king. The king is obviously taken with Mordecai, impressed with him. He said, you're not looking for a job, are you? Because we just happen to have an opening. <laughs> just came open. Would you like to be my prime minister? Second in command. Mordecai said, yeah, I'll take it. It's been a good day for me. <laughs> so the next thing you know, you've got the queen who is now Jewish, and now the prime minister is Jewish. The attack is against the Jewish people. So now the two most powerful people in, in the palace next to Xerxes are Jews. Is that by chance? Huh? Does that sound like, wow, what a struggle up? No, 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 listen to him. So, these, so Mordecai and Esther begin to beg the, queen, the king to reverse this law. The law that says you can attack these Jews and you've got to attack it. He said, eh, in Persia we, it doesn't work that way. Once the law is a law, it's the law. He said, however, I could write a new one. I could write an additional law. Why don't I make it a law that on March the 7th that all the Jews have a legal right to defend themselves? They said, we'll take that. So it was put into law that on March the 7th, if anybody messes with you, if you're a Jew and somebody messes with you, you can legally take them out. The law is circulated through all the provinces, all the towns, villages. Everybody hears of it. And on March the 7th, you're not going to believe what happened. Guys, I'm just going to tell you this is biblical proof that some people in this world are just stupid and there's nothing they can do about it. Just born stupid, live stupid, die stupid. They're just stupid people out there. In spite of everything that's happening, God is obviously working this against them. Did you know that on March the 7th, there were people who attacked the Jews? That's dumb, man. Dumb. The Bible Bible said on that day, 500 enemies of the Jews in the city of Susa alone were killed. You know how many Jews lost their life? I'll give you one guess. One guess. There you go. Zero. You know how many Jews were injured? You got, you know? 
Zero. I mean, listen, there wasn't a Jewish man that accidentally cut his finger while sharpening his sword. I mean, no injuries whatsoever. Nobody lost any property. And so in the city, 500 died. But out in the country, let me tell you what, we country people, we know how to do this. 75,000 enemies of the Jews died that day. Now Esther, this beauty queen, this fragile little beautiful beauty queen, the king goes to her that day and said, you good? She said, nope. He said, you want something else? She said, yep. She said, I want one more day of this. Yeah. She said, I want one more day. I want, and, I, and those ten boys, Haman's ten sons, I want them on a pole before dark. That's what I want. They impaled Haman's sons. And the next day, now this is where you move into the, uh, how would you say it? Uh, a whole new level of stupid. Right? I mean, you got 75,500 people dead. You got 10 guys stuck on a pole in somebody's backyard. And you know what? Somebody the next day chose to attack the Jews again. That's magnum stupid right there. You know what? Magnum stupid. 300 more were killed. And uh, when Mordecai kind of got the reports of everything, I tell you what he did. They had this huge celebration. They cooked turkeys. They had hams. They baked cakes. They gave away gifts. They sang songs together. You know what Mordecai said? This won't be the last time we celebrate this. He made a law that this would become a national holiday. And let me tell you what, even to this day, every year the Jews stop whatever they're doing and they celebrate how God delivered them from Haman's wrath. Did you know that? Why would Mordecai go, we can never forget this. I think there's a lesson here, guys. A lesson so big, so important. Mordecai didn't want the Jews to ever forget it. And i got to make sure that you know it before you leave here. And this is the lesson. Stand up for God and he'll stand up for you. You got it? Of all the lessons that can be learned from this story, and I, I believe that they're legion. There's a lesson that stands head and shoulders above the rest. Stand up for God and he will stand up for you. Now in those situations where everybody in the world is expecting you to do something or maybe even demanding that you do something, but you know that if you do what they expect or demand, you're going to be doing something that's wrong for you to do. Where do you find the courage to just act defiantly and say no? Thanks, but no thanks. That's not for me. How do you find that courage? Where do you find that courage? You've got to believe that if you stand for God, he's going to stand for you. You've got to believe that if your defiance leads you into a battle, that God will fight that battle for you. Isn't that what he did for Mordecai and the Jews? He protected them. Not a Jew lost their life. Not a Jew was injured. Not a Jew lost any property. How can that be? i tell you how. God divinely protected them. He rescued them. Even though this threat was very real, by March the 9th, this threat was gone. Gone. Over. They didn't have to worry about it or think about it anymore. As a matter of fact, if you look carefully, I believe God was planning the rescue long before the battle was a reality. Long before the threat was a reality. How do you explain the fact that a Jew ended up being the queen? How do you explain the fact that, that Mordecai overheard this assassination attempt? How do you explain that it was put into the royal records but not read until the king has a sleepless night? How do you explain the sleepless night? You know, and on the very night before, you know, Haman is seeking permission. How do you, was that all that a mere coincidence? Absolutely not. These were acts of divine providence. God made them happen because he was already planning the rescue before the attack was even a reality. God rewarded these Jews. Haman ended up with, uh, excuse me, Mordecai ended up with Haman's job. Esther ended up with Haman's estate. All the Jews were better off after the battle than they were prior to the battle. You got to admit, you saw it in the story that what the enemies of the Jews meant as a curse, God turned that thing right around and turned it into a blessing. What they meant for harm, God turned into incredible good for his people. And then God avenged those Jews. I mean, what, you know, Haman meant for Mordecai ended up happening 
to Haman himself. As a matter of fact, the Bible even uses the word opposite, that just what Haman wanted to happen, the opposite happened. You know, the Bible also uses the word backfire, which means that, you know, Haman pulled the trigger and the bullet didn't go out the barrel forwards. It came back through inflicting a fatal wound on himself. God, if need be, will always avenge his people. Rather than the Jews being slaughtered, the Jews slaughtered their enemies. The Jews stood up for God and God stood up for them. He did that for these people in this story because they were his people. And I believe with all of my heart that he will do the same thing for us. I believe he'll do it for you. But it's not enough for me to believe that. You've got to believe that. At first, Mordecai was distraught at the thought of what was about to happen to his people. But in time, he realized something. Hey, it's going to be okay. Somehow, some way, sometime, God's going to take up our cause. He's going to fight for us. That's what he told Esther. Deliverance will arise from somewhere. And we saw in hindsight, it was someone. Even Haman's family figured out that picking a fight with God's people is the same as picking a fight with God. Stand up for God and he'll stand up for you. Believe that and I'll tell you what you'll do. You'll dare to be different. Believe that. And you'll be defiant not compliant. Now, okay, we're wrapping up these series. We've learned all this stuff. In light of this, what are we going to do? Very simple. We're going to stand up and stand out. You got it? I'm about to let you go. Here's what we're going to do. Go to corner church. This is what we're going to do. We're going to stand up and stand out. It's time to stand up and stand out for God. From this point on, listen to me, we're going to dare to be different. I'm not talking about being different in the way we dress. I'm not talking necessarily about being different in the way we wear hair. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that we're going to think differently. We're going to have a different attitude. Our speech is going to be different. The way we treat people, we're going to treat them uh, differently than the world does. We're going to behave ourselves differently. We're going to put on display a different value system than the world has. We're going to put on display a different moral code than this world displays. By our lifestyle, others are going to see very clearly that we bow to one God, the true God, the God of the Bible. Why is this so critical? As a result of our defiance, God will not only reveal himself to us, he'll reveal himself to others. God's going to reveal himself to an unbelieving world. In other words, when we stand up and stand out, it gives others an opportunity to see God in us. We began 2016 and 2017 by taking a careful look at the same verse of the Bible, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. This is what we learned. In that verse, we're commanded not to think like the world. Because if we think like the world, we'll act like the world. And the problem in acting like the world is when we act like the world, we hide Jesus from the world. And who is it this world so desperately needs? They need him. When we blend in, we're preventing the world from seeing the one they really need. Stand up and you'll be blessed. Stand up and God will reveal himself to you. Stand up and God will reveal himself through you to an unbelieving world. And who knows where that might lead? They might come to trust and know the one true God. So I guess we could just wrap it up by saying this. Let's dare to be different. Let's become defiant. Not compliant. When we need to defy the world, when we need to say no, let's say no. I'm not talking about being a jerk. I'm not talking about being a jerk. But just being... Polite, courteous, but firm and going, that's not for me. I'm going to pass on that. Thanks, but no thanks. They'll figure it out. They'll know. If they ask you, why not? You can tactfully explain to them, well, it really kind of violates a personal conviction I have. I'd rather not. You say, but what if? What if they criticize me? What if they... You stand up for God. And he'll stand up for you. Let's pray together.
Father, I'm going to pray in front of this congregation what I've been praying through this series. Take this story and change the way we think. Because God, I'm afraid that for the most part, the church of my generation has come to believe that it's okay to just blend in. So we make costly compromises over and over and over. God, I want you to help us to leave this series understanding something. That's not what you expect from us at all. You expect us to be defiant where we need to be defiant so that we can become compliant with you. You want us to be different. You want us to stand out. You want people to see you and us. To do that, Lord, we need courage. And so this is what I'm praying, that through this sermon today, we find the courage, knowing this. That if we stand up for you, and it upsets someone, even to the degree that it would try to hurt us, you got our back. You'll take care of us. You'll fight our battle. So the best thing for us to do is just stand. Stand for you and believe with all our heart that you will stand for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray this together, Lord. Amen. Have a great holiday week. Have a safe holiday week. You're dismissed. Thank you so much.